My name is Alex Whitney, and this is Conspiracy 101. And today, we're going to be looking into the Hollow Earth. We are finally here. We're finally on the Hollow Earth. How exciting. Are you excited? I'm very excited. And as always, how could this be a Conspiracy 101? Without immediately starting. No, that's the wrong button. On the Wikipedia page. So, Hollow Earth. We've talked about it a couple of times on the show already without actually going into much detail. A lot of that is to do with Giantes. Um, and we t uh, did we talk about it in cryptids? No, because we haven't really done cryptids. The only cryptids we've done is big, um, British big cats. We did slightly talk about it on aliens, I guess. I swear it came up. Maybe it came up in the, um, in the Flat Earth episode we did. Right. Hollow Earth. You may have heard of it before, but what is it and what does it mean? Uh, if you haven't watched Conspiracy 101 before, we're going to go into the basics of what Hollow Earth is, and then we'll find some news articles, some websites to discuss the conspiracy slightly more on whether or not it is popular pseudoscience or something more real. The Hollow Earth is a concept proposing that the planet Earth is entirely hollow or contains a substantial interior space, notably suggested by Edmund Haley in the late 17th century. The notion was disprusen, 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 we disprused it, disproven, first tentatively by Pierre Bourdieu in 1740, and then definitively by Charles Hutton in his Schelhalian experiment around 1774. It is still occasionally defended through the mid-19th century, notably by John Cleve Sims Jr. and Jeremiah N. Reynolds. But by this time, it was part of popular pseudoscience and no longer a scientifically viable hypothesis. The concept of a hollow earth still recurs in folklore and as a premise for subterranean fiction, a subgenre of adventure fiction. So, this is a nice little... Cross-sectional drawing of the planet Earth showing the interior world by William, from William R. Bradshaw's science fiction novel The Goddess of Av Atvatabar. Atvatabar, you too! Uh, so the, uh, the premise, the idea... No, go away. Is... There we go. Is that you have <clears throat> our world and then interior world which may or may not have some kind of sun in the center, where it's basically like a, a reversed version of our world. That makes sense? So like the inside of a, inside of a sphere. And um, although, from what I understand, the idea of an inner earth this big is, you know, not true. Um, scientists have proven that the earth has very many layers. And uh, a very many of them are indeed quite hot. Uh, so this, this, as it stands like this, couldn't happen. But deep terrain cave systems, a version of a hollow earth, may still exist. Um, well, we'll see, we'll see. I don't know, we'll see. Mythology, obviously, yeah. Mythology, ancient times, um, the Greeks, the Romans, etc. All right, there we go. In ancient times, the concept of a subterranean land inside the Earth appeared in mythology, folklore, and legend. The idea of a subterranean realm seemed arguable and became intertwined with the concept of places of origin or afterlife, such as the Greek underworld, the Nordic Svartalfahim, the Christian Heel, and the Jewish Sheol with details describing inner earth in Kabbalistic literature, such as the Zohar and the Hesed Lahavrem. The idea of a subterranean realm is also mentioned in the Tibetan Buddhist belief. According to one story from the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, there is an ancient city called Shambhala, which is located inside the earth. We will be looking at that. That sounds awesome. According to the ancient Greeks, there were caverns under the surface, which were entrances leading to the underworld, some of which were the caverns were the caverns at Tainaron in Lyconia and Trozen in Argolis, at Aether in Thespro... I'm not going to say all these. 
in various places around the Greece Empire, Hellenistic Empire. It is said that caverns occupied by the ancient god called Zalmoxis. That's in Thracian and Dacian, Dar Darkian lessons. In Mesopotamian religion, there is a story of a man who, after traveling through the darkness of a tunnel in the mountain of Mashu, entered a subterranean garden. Uh, what's really interesting about these ones is that you could really mix the idea of teleportation and um, like plane skipping, going between dimensions, which is not something we've talked about, but is definitely something as an episode for Conspiracy 101. I guess we kind of talked about it with the, um, the man from Taled. Could he have been someone on his way to hell through a mountain and ended up in a Japanese airport. Who knows? The Celtic mythology. There is a legend of a cave called Krukan, also known as Ireland's Gate to Hell. That's a nice pub. A mythical and ancient cave from which, according to legend, strange creatures would emerge and be seen on the surface of Earth. There are also stories of medieval knights and saints who went on pil pilgrimages to a cave located in Station Island, County Dungal, Donegal, Donagal, Dungal, Dungal, in Ireland, where they made journeys inside the earth to a, into a place of purgatory. I'm pretty sure um, Dante's Inferno and Purgatorium and all those. Doesn't he just... Here we go. He, he walks in, doesn't he? The Italian writer Dante describes a hollow earth in his well-known 14th century work, Inferno, in which the fall of Lucifer from heaven caused an enormous funnel to appear in a previously solid and spherical earth, as well as an enormous mountain opposite it, Purgatoria. Native American mythology it is said the ancestors of the Mandan people in ancient times emerged from a subterranean land through a cave to the north side of the Missouri River. There is also a tale about a tunnel in the San Carlos Apache Indian Reservation in Arizona, near Cedar Creek, which is said to lead inside the earth to a land inhabited by a mysterious tribe. It is also the belief of the tribes of the Iroquois. Iroquois? Iroquois? I haven't played enough Assassin's Creed to know how to pronounce that. That their ancient ancestors emerged from a subterranean world inside the earth. The elders of the Hopi people believed that Sipaupu Sipapu? Sipapu, entrance in the Grand Canyon exists, which leads to the underworld. Brazilian Indians, who live alongside the Parima River in Brazil, claim that the forefathers emerged in ancient times from an underground land, and that many of their ancestors still remain inside the earth. Ancestors of the Inca supposedly came from caves which are located east of Cusco, Peru. So, lots and lots of mythology. I think a lot of that tracks back to... People used to use caves for habitation, didn't they? It's, very, it's a lot easier to find a nice cave and live in it than build yourself a house, uh, no matter what you're building it out of. Um, so we, I think humanity, in the very early days of humanity, or what could be called humanity, used caves a lot. And I think that's, a, a, that's, a, that's come through in our myths and our legends, these old stories of our ancestors that these people remember living in caves, you know, pass through the stories and the legends and the mythologies. Very interesting. The modern concept. Right, now we're getting into a conspiracy, conspiratorial realm rather than the mythology realm. The following lines from Act 3, Scene 2 of Shakespeare's play, A Midsummer Night's Dream, written in London in 1595 or 6, or both suggest the idea may have been known in Western Europe a hundred years before it took a more scientific form. Right. Just give me a moment. Just preparing for my Shakespearean training. Four years at the RADA for this. Hermia. Oh, no, I don't say that bit, do I? I'm Hermia. I'll believe as soon this whole earth may be bored and that the moon may through the centre creep and so displease a brother's noontide with antipodes. Thank you very much. I will not be peering in any amateur dramatic dramatics this Christmas for the local amateur dramatics society decided to kick me out. The notion was further popularised by 
Athanasius Kircher's non-fiction Mundus Subterraneus in 1665, which speculated that there is an intricate system of cavities and channels of water connected, connecting the poles. See, that's more interesting. The idea that there's a cavity and channels of water is kind of well known, isn't it? Where we get wells, you put wells down. There's lots of la layers of rock which have things going through them, whether it be mud or water, lava, in case you know, volcanoes. Um, ice how you get but the fact that the thought of the pole the north pole and the south pole being connected in some way is very interesting edmund haley in 1692 conjectured that the earth might consist of a hollow shell about 800 kilometers 500 miles thick two inner concentric shells and an innermost core the atmospheres separate these shells and each shell has its own magnetic poles the spheres rotate at different speeds Haley proposed this scheme in order to explain the anomalous compass readings he envisaged, 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 envisaged the atmosphere inside as luminous and possibly inhabited, and speculated that escaping gas caused the aurora, the aurora, the aurora borealis. At this time, in this Wikipedia article. So, Edmund Haley seems to be the main guy. And he was, so he was trying to explain anomalous compass readings. Now, anomalous compass readings, we know, compasses don't really work around certain... The whole North, North South Pole, uh, reason, reason we get the compass going to the North and the South and being able to do that is because of the magnetic... Um, what's the word for it? The magnetic... Magnetic... Just give me a second. BVM. Now, the M is a core. But in the Hebrew, one, two, three. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just electromagnetism, isn't it? And that's what um, points the compass in the right direction. But if you have strong influences via magnets, other magnets, pieces of iron, other magnetic metals, various things it can throw that off and uh, this comes up a lot in um if you ever watch air crash air crash investigation programs or read about various missing peoples who were lost because of um small planes um compasses going dodgy happens whether it's because of the atmosphere or because of something within the actual craft itself etc etc before the um advent of electronic, uh, electronical, electronic, electronical. Is electronical a word? It should be. Electronical. Electrical. Electric. <laughs> Ele <laughs> Electrical components, um, which relied on other methods to get the compass reading. Uh, it was it was entirely due to the the Earth's magnetic field. Field. That's the word I was looking for. Anyway. Leclerc Milford in 1781 led a journey with hundreds of Muscogee peoples to a series of caverns near the Red River, above the junction of the Mississippi River. According to Milford, the original Muscogee people's ancestors believed to have emerged out of the surface of the earth in ancient times. Could easily contain 15,000 to 20,000 families. So yeah, but having a community live within caves that's not unreal. Some of the cave systems are massive and crazy, aren't they? Um, it is often claimed that mathematician Leonard Euler proposed a single shell hollow earth with a small sun, a thousand kilometers across at the center, providing light and warmth for the inner earth civilization. But that is not true! Instead, he did a thought experiment of an object dropped into a hole, drilled through the center, unrelated to hollow earth. Unrelated. John Cleve Sims, Jr., in 1818, suggested the Earth consisted of a hollow shell about 13, 1,300 kilometers, 810 miles thick, with openings across at both poles, with four inner shells each open at the poles. Sims became the most famous of the early hollow Earth proponents, and Hamilton, Ohio, even has a monument to him and his ideas. Interesting. Uh, so they wanted to do an expedition to Antarctica in 1838 and 42. Since I've never wrote a book on the subject, several authors published works discussing his ideas. That's really interesting that 
someone, especially that time period, wouldn't write a book. Uh, so it goes with lots of books about his ideas. And then Journey to the Centre of the Earth by Jules Verne um, is a, a, describes an expedition to the Earth's interior via fictional Icelandic volcano Skartaris. Uh, the protagonists do not actually reach the centre, but nevertheless discover a subterranean ocean inhabited by creatures believed extinct. They escaped through another volcano on the Italian side of Stromboli. Uh, Paradise found the cradle of human race in the North Pole in 1885 by Warren. Presented his belief that humanity originated on a continent in, an, in the Arctic called Hyperborea. This influenced some early Hollow Earth proponents. Uh, according to Marshall Gardner, both the Eskimo and the Mongolian peoples had come from the interior of the Earth through the entrance of the North Pole. That's another one. There's, there's a few um, relatively famous versions of Hollow Earth, which we will uh, talk about separately as they come up. Um, and I'll go into them in more detail. 20th century. Uh, so lots of fiction. Uh, spiritualist writer... Um, Lady Paget was an early writer to mention the Hollow Earth hypothesis. She claimed that cities existed beneath a desert, which is where the people of Atlantis moved. Again, uh, uh, that's definitely I forgot about. I forgot we did an Atlantis episode. We've done two Atlantis episodes, so yeah, that's that's definitely a, a thing. Um, discovered in the twenty first century. Whoop whoop, Lady Paget. Marsh Nogada wrote A Journey to the Earth's Interior in 1913 and published an expanded edition in 1920. He placed an interior sun in the Earth and built a working model on the hollow, hollow Earth, which he patented. Okay. Uh, opening in Antarctic. So the idea that there's openings in the poles is very popular, isn't it? That's something to remember. Again, Atlantis, lots of uh, pulp magazines. Concave hollow Earths. Instead of saying... But humans live on the outside surface of a hollow planet, sometimes called a convex hollow Earth hypothesis. Some have claimed humans live on the inside surface of a hollow, spherical world, so that our universe itself lies in that world's interior. This has been called the concave hollow Earth hypothesis, or sky centrism. That is amazing. I love it. So the idea is that there is no down. We are entirely in ourselves. So everything to do with the universe is like enclosed in on itself. Wow. Cyrus Teed, a doctor from upstate New York, proposed such a concave hollow earth in 1869, calling his scheme cellular cosmo cosmogony? Cosmo cosmogony. T founded a group called the Korshan Unity based on his notion, which he called Korshanity. <laughs> oh, mate. A proper Korshanity right in my pants. Oh, why do you debase yourself, Alex, with such low humor? The main colony, based on this notion, oh, it survives as a preserved Florida State Historic Site at Estero, Florida, but all of Teed's followers have now died. It's a shame. Teed's followers claim to have experimentally verified the concavity of Earth's curvature through surveys of the Florida coastline making use of rectilini rectilineator equipment. That would be very interesting. Several 20th century German writers, including Peter Bender, Johannes Lang, Karl Newport, and Fritz Braut published works advocating the Hollow Earth Hypothesis, or Hall Welterhell. It has even been reported, though, though apparently without historical documentation, that Adolf Hitler was influenced by the concave Hollow Earth ideas and sent an expedition in an unsuccessful attempt to spy on the British feet by pointing infrared cameras up at the sky. Yeah, see, that would be a really weird conclusion to that wouldn't it but if you looked if you were able to look hard enough you'd see the opposite side of the world so that would be so strange wouldn't it if, if not the Hubble telescope but the, the newer one or one that comes up and then it looks so far that it sees you know India on the other side or something ridiculous like that or itself no it wouldn't see itself another satellite Spooky. 
The Egyptian mathematician Mostafa Adel Kadar wrote several scholarly papers working out detailed mapping of the concave Earth model. Um, Occam's razor saying, okay, so you know, the, the idea that the easiest solution is usually the most probable. Okay, so contrary evidence. The is that a hard to see? Skihalian, Shai, Shi, Shihalian, in 1737, Pierre Bourget and Charles Marie de la Condamine chartered an expedition from France to Chimborazo volcano in Ecuador. Arriving and climbing the volcano in 1738, they conducted a vertical deflection experiment at two different altitudes to determine how local mass anomalies affected gravitational pull. In a paper written a little over 10 years later, Bourgeois commentated that his results had at least falsified the hollow earth theory. In 1772, Neville Maskelyne proposed to repeat the same experiment to the Royal Society. Within the same year, the Cosm Committee of Attraction was formed and they sent Charles Mason to find the perfect candidate for the vertical deflection experiment. Mason found that Skillian Mountain, Skihalian Mountain, where the experiment took place and not and not only supported the earlier Chimborazo experiment, but yielded far greater results. So they're basically proving that the Earth has a lot of mass to it. There's stuff inside the Earth. Seismic. The picture of the structure of Earth has been arrived at through the study of seismic waves. Uh, it's quite different from the fully hollow Earth. The time it takes for seismic waves to travel through and around the Earth directly contradicts a fully hollow sphere. The evidence indicates that the Earth is mostly filled with solid rock, mantle and crust, liquid nickel iron alloy outer core, and a solid nickel iron inner core. So by sending waves, sound, motion through the Earth, seismic waves happen because of earthquakes, the movements of the crust. Again, this is my geography background. I know all about this. Um, you get ripples, you get movement, and you can track that movement and guess um, because we don't, we can't drill that far down. Um, what the Earth is made from, from observations like that. Um, so it kind of puts the idea of a, a completely hollow Earth, it puts it on the back burner. Um, I think there probably is the ability for hollow chambers to exist, but the entirety of the Earth being hollow is just, it's one of those things that kind of, um, it's like the, the moon, uh, landings and going around the moon and seeing the dark side of the moon uh, and sort of saying, oh, no, no aliens here. That doesn't mean it doesn't, isn't true. The conspiracist in me, um, this could all be a ruse. But we shall see as we go on further. Gravity. Another set of scientific arguments against the hollow Earth or any hollow planet comes from gravity. Massive objects tend to clump together in gravitational, creating non-hollow spherical objects such as stars and planets. The idea, yeah, so gravity would force everything down because it's so big, it, it, the amount of gravity pushing on it would cause, it, we wouldn't allow for hollowness. Direct observation. Drilling holes does not provide direct evidence against the hypothesis. The deepest hole drilled to date is the Kola Superdeep Borehole, with a true vertical drill depth of more than seven and a half miles. However, the distance to the centre of the Earth is nearly 4,000 miles. This is the problem. You can't drill that deep. Seven and a half miles is nothing, isn't it, when you think of how thick the Earth is? And how thick just the crust would be. In fiction, we're not going to go through this because this is kind of, you know, popular art. Also see, uh, Hollow Moon. I did not know that was a thing. The Dyson Sphere is relatively famous. Should we have a quick look at that? That's the um, hypothetical megastructure complete with encompassing star. So you have a star in the centre and then you live on something that's on the inside. Kind of like a concave Earth, really, more than a, um, more than a hollow Earth. Uh... Right, we've got Shamba Shambhala and we've got Hyperborea, but there's Agartha as well. Is Agartha not on this page at all? Okay, right, give me a second. And I will get, I thought, I thought this was already here. Uh, but it's not. It's strange that that wouldn't be on the Hollow Earth. Um, mm, is that not a bit odd, don't you think? Agatha, Agatha, sometimes Agata, Agati, Agaraf, Agata, Agata, or Agatha. 
is a legendary kingdom that is said to be located in the Earth's core. How is that not has not how is that not related? It is related to a belief in a hollow Earth. Wikipedia is a popular popular subject of esotericism. History. The legend of Agatha remained mostly obscure in Europe until Gerard Encous edited and republished a detailed 1886 account by the 19th century French occultist Alexandre Saint-Yves de Aldre, Aldre Mission de in, in Europe, in 1910. After World War I, I think you mean the First World War, German occultist groups such as the Fuel, Fuel, is it Fuel or is it Tuel? Tule Society took an interest in Agatha. In 1922 book, in his 1922 book, in 1922 book, Beasts, Men and Gods, the Polish explorer Ferdinand Osendowski relates a story which was imparted to him concerning a subterranean kingdom existing inside the earth. This kingdom was known to the fictional Buddhist society as Agati. Connections to mythology. Agatha is frequently associated and confused with Shambhala. Um, I don't know why I've heard of Agatha then. I don't, it's a really small Wikipedia article. But keep that in your head, because it's one of those things that seems to... I think of Agatha as the, the preeminent hollow earth society, like, um, civilization. Shambhala. In Tibetan Buddhist tradition, Shambhala also spelled Shambhala, or Shambhala, is a spiritual kingdom. Shambhala is mentioned in the Kala Chakra Tantra. The Bon scripture speaks of a closely related land called Tag Zig Olmo Lung Ring. The Sanskrit name is taken from the name of a city mentioned in the Hindu Puranas. The exact length of Shambhala is 225 yojans, approximate, as per Vishnu Purana. The myth of, is that relevant? The mythical re, mythological relevance of the place originates with a prophecy in Vishnu Purana, according to which Shambhala will be the birthplace of Kalki, the next incarnation of Vishnu, who will usher in the new age, and a prophesized ruling of the kingdom of Maitreya, the future Buddha. Interesting. Lovely bit of that. Shambhala is ruled by the future Buddha Ma Maitreya. The text Shambhala narrative is found. Okay, it's, okay, it's more just fiction, isn't it? Western reception. Tibet and Tibetan Buddhism were largely unknown in the West prior to the, 19, uh, to the 20th century. Uh, the name itself, however, was reported as early as the 17th century by a Portuguese missionary and, it, and thought it was another name for Cafe or China. That's interesting. Uh, theosophy. Uh, during the 19th century, the Theosophical, Theosophical, Theosophical Society, co-founder Helen Blavatsky, alluded to the Shambhala myth. Blavatsky, who claimed to be in contact with the Great White Lodge of the Himalayan Adepts, mentioned Shambhala in several places, but without giving an especially great emphasis. Later esoteric writers further emphasized and elaborated on the concept of a hidden land inhabited by a hidden mystical brotherhood whose members labor for the good of humanity. So this is very um, getting into that sort of esoteric knowledge, like knowledge that is you know, unknown to the majority, but uh, only known to a few. Alice A. Bailey claims Shambhala, Shambhala, her spelling, is an extra dimensional spiritual reality on the astral plane, a spiritual center where the governing deity of Earth, Sanat Kumara, dwells its highest avatar at the planetary logos of Earth and is said to be an expression of the will of God. That was a lot of words. That's a lot of big words in your sentence there. I like it. Um, very interesting. Again, another extra dimensional aspect. Expeditions and location hypothesis. Uh, the Rorich is Helena and Nicholas led a 1924-28 expedition named oh, I wish I was rich enough to just go off on an expedition somewhere like, oh yeah I'm just going to go spend four years looking for places they also believed that the Beluka mountain in the Altai mountains was the entrance to Shambhala a common belief in that region inspired by a theosophical law and several visiting Mongol lamas Gleb Boki the chief of the Bolshevik cryptographer the chief Bolshevik 
cryptographer and one of the bosses of the Soviet secret police, along with his writer friend Alexander Barchenko, embarked on a quest for Shambhala in an attempt to merge the Tantra ideas of, com <laughs> of communism in the 1920s. Uh, okay. Among other things, in a secret laboratory affiliated with the secret police, Boki and Barashenko experimented with Buddhist spiritual techniques to try and find a key for engineering the perfect communist human beings. I think you mean Russian super soldiers. They contemplated a special edition expedition to Inner Asia to retrieve the wisdom of Shambhala. I, I'm saying that wrong, aren't I? Sham, Sham, Shambhala? I don't know. The project fell through as a result of intrigues within Soviet intelligence service, as well as rival efforts of the Soren, Soviet Foreign Commissariat that sent its own exhibition to Tibet in 1924. French Buddhist Alexandre David Neil, David Neil, associated Shambhala with Balkh in present-day Afghanistan, also offering the Persian Shambhala, elevated candle as an etymology of its name. Ooh, wouldn't that be interesting if it was in Afghanistan? That's why it's just been decimated by so many of the countries around it. The Americans, the Russians. They're all looking through the entrance to the Hollow Earth. Uh, Hitler sent several expeditions to Tibet in nine phase to contact Agatha and Shabahala, supposedly as part of Nazi esotericism. We will do an entire, we'll do multiple episodes on Nazis. Uh, Nazis. They're very interesting uh, with what they believe. Oh, it's in Uncharted 2, Among Thieves. <laughs> okay, very interesting. Oh, Agarth is on this one. Right, and the next one is Hyperborea. In Greek mythology, the Hyperboreans were a mythical people who lived in the far north part of the known world. Their name appears to derive from the Greek beyond Boreas, the god of the north wind. Although some scholars prefer the a Derivation, deriva, derivative, derivation, derivation from to carry over. Despite their location in an otherwise frigid part of the world, the Hyperboreans were believed to inhabit a sunny, temperate, and divinely blessed land. In many versions of the stories, they lived north of the Riffian Mountains, which shielded them from the effects of the cold north wind. The oldest myths portray them as favourites of Apollo, and some ancient Greek writers regarded the Hyborians as the mythical founders of Apollo's shrines at Delos and Delphi. Later writers disagreed on the existence and location of the Hyperboreans, with some regarding them as purely mythological, and others connecting them to real-world peoples and places in northern Eurasia, the Britain, Scandinavia or Siberia. In medieval and Renaissance literature, the Hyperboreans became to, came to signify remoteness and exoticism, Modern scholars consider the Hyporian myth to be an amalgam of ideas from ancient utopianism, the edge of the earth stories, the cult of Apollo, and exaggerated reports of phenomena in northern Europe, e.g. the Arctic midnight sun. This is really interesting. The Greeks did venture as far as the Arctic Circle. And when, when the guy came back and said, the whole place is in white, covered in snow, and there are, bear, there are white bears everywhere. White bears. Everyone thought it was a lunatic. <laughs> so the idea that they would take notions of, you know, these people are trading, the Greeks are trading with, I don't know, the Gauls or um, the Germanic tribes, and the Germanic tribes are, uh, are dealing with uh, what, who is, the people in Russia, and the Russians are dealing with the Finnish, and the Finnish are de dealing with the, um, the uh, Inuits. The Inuits are obviously going to have stories of polar bears, of midnight suns, of the aurora borealis, of various other phenomena, sun dogs, weird stuff that happens that doesn't happen in Greece. And this will all filter back, and I think it's become a legend. It's become part of their mythos. Um, because unless you went and saw it, someone's saying it's snowing all the time, and in the winter, it, the sun never rises, you'd call them a a lunatic, wouldn't you? You'd, you'd think they were mental um, 3,000 years ago. Uh, so I can totally believe that. And the Arctic, although it's a very hos inhospitable place, you can live there. People have lived there for thousands of, tens of thousands of years. Um, and when it is sunny, if anybody's been on a, sn a snowboarding or a ski trip, as long as you're wrapped up, it is really nice. It is really sunny. And to 
although they might have confused temperate with with sun, um, it's really interesting, isn't it? I I I, I feel like this is just this is just the Greeks making mythology out of reality, which does happen a lot. Okay, so Herodotus uh, got de various locations, classical sources, ancient identification with Britain. Herbora was identified with Britain first by Hec in the fourth century BC as a preserved fragment. Um, in the regions beyond the land of the Celts, there lies in the ocean an island no smaller than Sicily. This island, the account continues, is situated in the north and is inhabited by the Hyborians, who are called by that name because their home is beyond the point whence the north wind, the Boris, blows. And the island is both fertile and productive of every crop and has an unusually temperate climate. That would be very true. Britain is a real outlier. If you, if you look at the lines of um, latitude, Britain, Great Britain, Gr British Isles, Scotland, Wales, England, Northern Ireland, Ireland, however you want to work, these, these islands that I myself live upon is in the same, same sort of band, the same area as Canada. It is above the USA. Uh, so why aren't we as cold as Canada? We're really lucky because the Atlantic basically just is a, is a, a phenomena called the North Atlantic Drift, uh, or the jet stream, you know, we'll call it. there's lots of different words for it. It basically pushes warm water up from the, the Gulf of Mexico and surrounding areas where it gets warm, pushes it up, and, and that uh, changes our, our climate. Um, it changes European climate as well. We also get, sometimes we get nice, uh, for example, at the moment, this is November, and I can go outside in a T-shirt. It's that warm, and it's because we are having hot air pushed up from the continental uh, North Africa. Very, very interesting that they would um, link those two. I think that's really interesting. And we do. We have, uh, we have great soils for crops, and um, because of our climate, we're not, just very, we're not just okay, not too cold, not too warm, but we're also very wet, uh, which is also good for crops. Um, Northern devotive offerings of spherical shapes. Some scholars don't have a temple of Stonehenge. Yeah, we, we've had people living on this island for a very long time. We used to be connected to uh, Europe through a place called Doggerland. So people walked up. It's not a, it's not an isolated island like some other islands like uh, Madagascar. People had to sail in order to get to Madagascar um, and inhabit that island. Uh, Great Britain didn't because we walked across. Legends. Along with Tule, Hyperborea is one of several, several terra incognitae to the Greeks and Romans, where Pliny, Pindar, and Herodotus, as well as Virgil and Cicero, reported that people lived to the age of 1,000 and enjoyed lives of complete happiness. Hey, that's Britain for you. Okay, so again, uh, I'm getting a bit bored of all this. Modern interpretations. Yep. Okay, esoteric four, yep. Uh, cool, right, let's move on to something a little more fun. Okay, so we have... All right, should we... Mm, what do we do? What do we do? Do we go for news articles? No, news, news articles I feel like are... They're going to be more... They're going to be more deadpan. Let's go for the weird first. Uh, let's change that. I think that would be better. Yeah. The Museum of Unnatural Mystery. The Unmuseum.org. Love it. This, is, this website looks amazing. Thank you. The Hollow Earth. Some people claim UFOs come from the center of the Earth. A little UFO, there he is. Perhaps some of the most bizarre scientific theories ever considered. Shall I zoom in a little bit? Will that, no, that, that works, cool. Uh, I might change that back out for it, actually. Um, yeah, let's just keep it like that, that's fine. Uh, Perhaps some of the most bizarre scientific theories ever considered were the, those concerning the possibility that the Earth was hollow. One of the earliest of these were, was proposed in 1692 by Edmund Halley. Edmund Halley was a British, brilliant English astronomer whose mathematical calculations pinpointed the return of the comet that bears his name. Halley was fascinated by the Earth's magnetic field. He no, see, <laughs> That happens a lot in conspiracy theories. This is one of those things, taking my, taking my uh, silver tinfoil hat off. Look, when people are explaining stuff like this, they might say that they are 
have a degree in something like geography and then start talking about something completely different that they might not have knowledge in. Um, just because they're good at one thing doesn't mean they're good at everything. And you'll see this a lot. There was, uh, I can't remember what it was to do. There was a Nobel Prize, Nobel Prize winner and he was talking about some crap. Basically, he had, his Nobel Prize was in like chemistry or something and he was talking about something to do with physics. And that's the kind of thing. They might be very clever. They might be well um, up to date with everything they're talking about. But don't take it as this person's a doctor. Therefore, they are clever. Do your own research. Haley was fascinated by the Earth's magnetic field. He noticed the direction of the field varied slightly over time. And the only way he could account for this was there existed not one, but several magnetic fields. Kind of. Haley came to, be to believe that the Earth was hollow and within it was a second sphere with another field. In fact, to account for all the variations in the field, Haley finally proposed that the Earth was composed of some four spheres, each nestled inside one another. It's awesome. It's scary. But maybe we're on um, this one. Haley also just, just... Can't get my words out. I can't get... I, I know I'm bad with my pronunciations and my words, but for some reason today, I feel like something's just happened today. And it's just making me a little bit... Can you see the... It's like claw marks. The devil. Haley also su <laughs> suggested that the interior of the Earth was populated with life and lit by a luminous atmosphere. He thought the Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights, was caused by the escape of this gas through a thin crust at the poles. Others picked up Haley's hollow Earth theory, often adding their own twists. In the 18th century, Leonhard Euler, a Swiss mathematician, replaced the multiple spheres theory with a single hollow sphere, which contained a sun 600 miles wide and provided heat and light for an advanced civilization that lived there. We read on Wikipedia that that's made up. Later, so take what you take what you will out of that one. Later, Scottish mathematician Sir John Leslie proposed there were two inside suns, which he named Pluto and Proserpine. Proserpine? One of the most ardent supporters of the Hollow Earth was American John Sims. Sims was an ex-army officer and a businessman. Suspect. Sims believed that the Earth was hollow and that the North and South Poles there were at entrances 4,000 and 6,000 miles wide, respectively, that led to the interior. Symes, Sims, pronounced it different every time, dedicated much of his life to the advance in his theory and raising money to support an expedition to the North Pole for this purpose of exploring the inner Earth. He was never successful, but after his death, one of his followers, a newspaper editor named Jeremiah Reynolds, helped influence the US government to send an expedition to Antarctica in 1838. While the explorers found no hole there, they did bring back convincing evidence that Antarctica was not just a polar ice cap, but the Earth's seven continent, seventh continent. In 1846, the discovery of an extinct woolly mammoth frozen in the ice in Siberia was used by Marshall Gardner as evidence of a hollow Earth. Gardner subscribed to the single sun inside the Earth theory and suggested that the mammoth was so well preserved because it had died recently. Gardner thought that mammoths and other extinct creatures wandered freely in the interior of the Earth. This one had wandered outside by using the hole at the North Pole then was frozen and carried to Siberia on an ice floe. That same decade, a new theory about the hollow earth appeared. It was the brainchild of Cyrus Reed Teed. Great name. Teed proposed that the earth was a hollow sphere and that people lived on the inside of it. In the centre of the sphere was a sun, which was half dark and half light. As the sun turned, it gave the appearance of a sunset and sunrise. The dense atmosphere in the centre of the sphere prevented observers from looking up into the sky and seeing the other side of the world. Interestingly enough, Teed's theory was hard for 19th century mathematicians to disprove based on geometry alone, since the exterior of a sphere can be mapped onto the interior with little trouble. Teed changed his name to Koresh. Uh oh. Well, as soon as they change their name to Koresh, you know there's going to be problems. And founded what might today be called a cult. After buying a 300-acre tract in Florida, Koresh declared himself the messiah of a new religion. 
He died in 1908 without proving his ideas. Even after his death, though, some continue to subscribe to this theory. The story is told that during World War II, Hitler sent an expedition to the Baltic island of Rügen. There, Dr. Heinz Fischer pointed a telescope camera into the sky in an attempt to photograph the British fleet across the hollow interior of a concave earth. He was apparently unsuccessful, and the British fleet remained safe. Apparently unsuccessful. So, we, mm, we don't know. Mm. After World War II, there seems to be a continuing connection between hollow earth stories and Nazi Germany. One author, Ernst Zundel, wrote a book entitled UFOs, Nazi Secret Weapons, claiming that Hitler and his last battalion had boarded submarines at the end of the war, escaped to Argentina, and then established a base for flying saucers in the holes leading to the interior of the Earth at the South Pole. Zundel also suggested that the Nazis had originated as a separate race that had come from the inner Earth. As time has gone on, the idea of a hollow Earth has become less of a theory of fringe science and more of a subject of science fiction and fantasy. We have seen that. Perhaps this has happened because new discoveries continue to show there is no validity to most of the hollow earth ideas. The United States Navy Admiral Richard Byrd flew across the North Pole in 1926 and the South Pole in 1929 without seeing any holes leading to an inner earth. Photographs taken by astronauts in space show no entrances either. Modern geology indicates the earth is mostly a solid mass. Yeah, the modern geology bit, not really relevant. Taking pictures though and not seeing any holes. Top tier science. One believer did see on NASA photograph showing a black hole at the North Pole and called it proof of an entrance to a hollow earth. As it turned out, the photo was actually a composite of several pictures taken over 24 hours, so that all sections were seen in daylight, and the black hole at the top was a portion of the Arctic Circle never illuminated during the day over winter months. So this is what it actually looks like. Ish. Perhaps the most well-known of the books about hollow earth is Burns' Journey to the Centre of the Earth. Uh, passages with surface loads of cabins. Yep, in the book, Scientists Climb. Okay, yep, yep, yep. In addition to, the kind of, to this kind of hollow Earth, there may be a hollow Mars. A Mars rock discovered in Antarctica suggests the bacteria may have and might continue to exist underground on the red planet. Ooh. 1997. This is awesome. This is definitely one of the uh, <laughs> the museum museum of unnatural mystery is definitely a website we will be returning to thank you very much sir right so the next ones we've got are basically buzzfeedy articles about hollow earth which i figured would go through because why not this is from blaze oh oh my god that's my doorbell i'll see you in a minute Apologies. I had important business to do. Importers and parcels for important people. Right, uh, where were we? This is from Blaze. I've never heard of it, but apparently it's got a channel. The truth behind the Hollow Earth conspiracy theory. Finally, the truth. Well, this, um... They're both kind of awkward, aren't they? Let's do this one. The archetype of the wacky conspiracy theory... Wacky. Nowadays is the flat earth theory. Oh, okay, fair enough. The theory that people refuse to believe that the world is spherical and held up to be the daftest of all alternative thinkers. Flat earth are effectively being shorthand for lunatic to many. For some reason, ideas like these seem to anger large waves of the population who argue that if it cannot currently be proven by science, it cannot be true. While there's little logic to that argument, it does kind of ignore the fact that science is only a collection of the best information currently available. New data comes to light every day, which proves and disproves various speculations, hypotheses, and ideas. One other thing that sceptic community are particular vociferous about is the notion of a hollow earth. You can understand it to a degree. The science does, admittedly, look pretty strong on this one. But is that enough? Uh, we've done the history, we've done literature, what believers say. Oh, we've got some quotes. This would be good. 
Rodney Clough, the author of the book World Top Secret, Our Earth is Hollow, says on the subject. <clears throat> my conception of the hollow earth based on my research is that the shell of the earth is about 800 miles thick from the outside to the inner surface. Half the planet is taken up by surface weight and then there's empty space and then something else. Suspended in the center of the hollow is an interior sun that is divided by day and night sides. The other part of the hollow earth area is that near the north and south pole are substantial openings that lead into the interior. More and more people are coming to terms with the fact that the hollow earth, the earth is hollow. I get emails from people learning about it every day. It's definitely growing in popularity, certainly not in the millions, but maybe in the thousands. That accent changed a lot in six sentences. According to Clough, there's something of a rivalry between hollow earthers and flat earthers too. Wow. That's, that's a, a wrestling match I'd love to watch. I don't know how the flat earthers can be so confused. He's told the sun ones. They're obviously wrong. The world is not flat, it is hollow. They reject all the evidence. What non-believers say. Uh, we've never dri drilled to the center of the earth, and I don't think we ever will. Uh, no one can officially disprove the theory. Oil wells can drill miles into the dirt, but usually at angles. The true vertical depth of most is around two miles. The deepest drill, and we talked about it, seven and a half miles long. And given that the center is further 4,000 miles, can't really do that with proof. Direct observation is impossible, and that's one of the reasons why it keeps on going. That was a terrible article. Well done, Blaze. Right, next. What? <laughs> is PolitiFact? I thought PolitiFact was like a, a thing where they um, like genuinely talked through what politicians are saying uh, and, and say whether or not it's true or not. Has a politician talked about this? Um, is turn is or is it just turned into Snopes? Uh, okay. Antarctica has an entrance to a different world, a mythic land with green forests, giant animals, and extraterrestrial technologies. Apparently, this is pants on fire. <laughs> yes, my time is short. Scientists know the Earth is not hollow. Elites are not trying to hide the North and South Poles from the public. Life is impossible inside the Earth. Wow, that's just, just ruined this whole video, hasn't it? Um, is this going to be the same kind of thing? Elsewhere, elsewhere where? Webcache, do you use a constant? Oh, that's just random crap. Hollow evidence. Uh, uh, Floralization. <laughs> Keep out. Uh, our ruling. Okay, let's just read the last bit. Because most of what that says above it is what we've already talked about. An Instagram post claims that there is an enormous void below Antarctica, where a different world exists there, and that it can be accessed through a hole in Antarctica. The post also claims that elites are conspiring to keep that a secret. Scientists are sure that the Earth is not hollow, partly because it's much denser than the rocks found on the surface. Elites are not hiding the poles from the public. They can be seen in the satellite images and visited by tourists. And life is impossible deep inside the Earth. We rate as post pants on fire. See, this is really interesting. This is where the, like, All right, let's break this down. Could there be a hole in Antarctica? Could there be something under Ant Antarctica? Antarctica is a continent. It has, you know, Earth. The ice is super, super thick. Could there be caves down there? We've already drilled through the ice and found pockets of water, lakes, where animals, animals, where life is existing. Um, very basic life. Could that, you know, could there be caves, a cavernous system underneath it? Maybe. Probably not, but maybe. Are elites conspiring to keep that a secret? I think elites are trying to, cons uh, are conspiring to keep Antarctica safe. In whatever way they deem that to be true, <laughs> um, and what their version of safe is, but the Antarctic, Antarctica is a very strange continent in that there's lots of different countries kind of protecting it from all the other countries. If just one country was looking after it, they would probably exploit it in various different ways. 
But because there's so many other countries watching their back and then they watching their back, no one's done that yet. Scientists are sure that the Earth is not hollow. Yeah, that, that's, we, you can kind of, you can see how scientists would come to that conclusion based on all the different factors that we've talked about. Partly because it's much denser than the rocks found on the surface, seismic waves, etc., etc. Um, they can be seen from satellite images. Yes. We can see from satellite images the North and South Poles. Would that be good enough uh, resolution available to the public? I'm sure America <laughs> has great resolution of the North and South Poles. But what's available to the public, would that be... Would we be able to see anything, even if it was there? If there was a hole there, a cave, an entrance? Probably not. And visited by tourists. That's a really interesting one because there's not really a tourist place to visit. Uh, visiting Antarctica is really expensive. And when you go there, you, there are lots of rules and restrictions about what you can do there. There are people on Antarctica pretty much year round, um, but most of them are scientists. And if you're already of the persuasion of conspiracy, then you're not going to keep, you're not going to think, you know, scientists are, are doing what you are. Uh, yeah, scientists are going to be doing science stuff, aren't they? So could, could I as a tourist go visit and explore Antarctica or the Arctic in the way I see fit if I had lots and lots of money? Discount the money. Probably not. I think there would be people and forces involved that might try and stop me pissing about on the Antarctic continent. I don't know, maybe not. Uh, and life is impossible deep inside the Earth. Well, yes, maybe really deep inside the Earth because we've drilled really far down and all we've found is rock. Um, but within cave systems, there are lots of evidence of civilizations grown in and out and around caves. So that's a bit silly. Pants on fire. Harsh. Right. Atlas Obscura. This is from 2015. Oh, but updated. Updated. Uh, once a serious scientific theory, the idea now attracts the conspiracy minded with tales of giants living within the planet. Ooh, giants. They are a bar, Alice. A uh, 19th century proponent of Hollow Earth theory suggested, theory posited, that the Aurora Borealis was created by a gas escaping from the inner Earth. From time immemorial. That's just the best way to start anything, isn't it? People have believed that there is another world lying just beneath the surface of our planet. To a number of cultures, the ancient Greeks, for one, is a dark place filled with the souls of the dead. But most of these, those early beliefs were metaphorical or mythological in origin. That's always an awkward one, isn't it? Like, we can't really go back and talk to the Greeks, but I don't think they thought they were... I would... I would... I would posit that they would think that they were real. Modern science holds that the Earth is an unbroken series of layers, crusts and liquid magma, surrounding a dense, hot core made primarily of iron and nickel. But in the 17th century, some of the leading scientific minds of the time had a different theory, that the planet is actually hollow. This idea has proved incredibly durable. <laughs> Odd word to use. Even today, there is a small cadre of Hollow Earth believers who are fighting valiantly to validate their ideas through books, websites, meetings, and some extremely ambitious travel plans. Possibly the first person to scientifically speculate about the Hollow Earth was none other than Edmund Haley of Haley's Comet fame, proposed in 1692 as a way of... Why is that highlighted archive i don't know let's go into something uh anomalous compass readings haley's theory yep we've talked about that that is a beautiful illustration from john cleve sims oh a book on him he didn't write any books oh imagine if we found a lost book by john sims uh it was expanded yep yeah. uh first declaration sims proposed uh to mountain yep go to north pole Oh, look at this. Light gives light to light discover ad infinitum. To all the world, I declare the earth is hollow and habitable within, containing a number of solid concentric spheres, one within another, and that it is open at the poles 12 or 16 degrees. I pledge my life in support of this truth and am ready to explore the hollow 
if the world will support and aid me in the undertaking. Of Hawaii, Ohio, late captain of infantry. Note, I have ready for the press a treatise on the principles of the matter, wherein I show proofs uh, of the above positions, account for various phenomena, and disclose Dr. Darwin's golden secret. My terms are the patronage of this and new worlds. I dedicate to my wife and her ten children. Woo, boy! I select Dr. S. L. Mitchell, Sir Davy, and Baron Alex de Humboldt as my protectors. I ask 100 brave companions, well equipped to start from Siberia in the full sea season, with reindeer and sleighs on the ice of the frozen sea. I engage, we find warmth and rich land, stocked with thrifty vegetables and animals, if not men, while reaching one degree northward of latitude 82. We will return in the succeeding spring. I'd, I'd go with him. He sounds awesome. Sims hole, as it would appear, in a lunarian with a telescope. That's the first time I've seen Sims Hole. In 1822, Congress considered funding an expedition to find the entrance to the inner Earth. The vote failed, and Sims never made the trip. That's a real shame. Uh, and then Jules Verne. Uh, so this is 19th century novels like The Goddess of Advalbar, elaborated on the theories. Again, it kind of goes into that science fiction-y era. Um... Among most believers. Oh, here we go. Modern belief in the Hollow Earth theory can be a bit hard to pin down, encompassing such disparate subjects as the Northern Lights and even an escaping Hitler. But despite the variations, of, and a few themes do seem to be common among Hollow Earth truthers. Among most believers, the inside of the Hollow Earth is a lush tropical paradise that very likely houses an advanced race of humans, aliens, giants, no matter where they come from, they are generally characterized as peace-loving and advanced far beyond those on the Earth's surface. The perfect climate believed to exist in the Hollow Earth is said to produce animals and people that are larger and more healthy, uh, far more healthy than those on the surface. The inner world is sometimes called or associated with Agatha, a legendary city in the Earth's core often tied to Eastern mysticism. Giants. I'm saying giants. My conception of the hollow earth, based on my research, is that the shell of the earth is about 800 miles thick. Oh, okay, so this is the same quotes from the same guy. Um, oh, ooh, okay. So this is interesting. So this is an extra little 2022 bit. As of 2022, a team of hollow earth advocates was planning, was again planning to mount an expedition on a nuclear-powered icebreaker. This expedition was previously delayed by the pandemic. Not many countries have icebreakers. Russia has a boatload of them. Okay. I think America only has like one. Canada has a few. Com weird countries like China have one. Um, but yeah, not many countries have them. They're, so probably a Russian one, which even after the pandemic, uh, again, that's going to be really awkward. Because I would imagine, although I'm not entirely sure, the majority of these people are going to be American. They believe there is a hole in the sea floor. That's an interesting one. That is one we haven't heard. Right at the end, curveball. Which will allow access to the interior of the Earth under the near constant cloud cover and ice of the Arctic Sea, seven days out from Murmansk, Russia. Even if they don't find it, the hollow Earth theory will likely continue on until humans can actually peer into the Earth's core. Who can say that it's not filled with Germans or aliens or a very small sun? That's better. I like, that's the kind of attitude I like. None of this politifact crap where it's, oh, it's all rubbish. I think drilling down and seeing what's inside the earth would, is not just a, a fool's errand because uh, geothermal technologies um, getting, turning the heat from the earth. It's very, very hot down there heat from the earth uh, into power is something that's done in quite a few countries where the, the crust is thinner 
than um, over other so other countries. So they when they draw down because it's thinner, they're getting the heat easier. If we can get the technologies, we'll put the technologies, put the um, get the 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 weight of humanity behind it. We would not only figure out whether or not the Earth is hollow, but also we might get some you know energy reliance on something other than uh, wind and solar. But that's just that's just one man's theory in a world full of crap. Right, uh, is that going to work? Yeah, it worked! Go me! Just muted myself, sorry. Picture of the week! Right, um... Let's do picture of the week. Right, so this is a weird one, which I might have to explain. But I was watching... Was I watching? What was I watching? Yes, I was watching a video about a um, caffeine overdose. And you can actually... In drinks, kind of hard to do. But um, when people make their own drinks, sometimes they put in too much caffeine. And it made me think, how much caffeine is in other drinks? And um, let's go like this, perfect. And then let's do that. And then you can roughly see. Um, so let's start at the bottom. Uh, this is just a, a, an image, an infographic of um, how much <laughs> caffeine is in drinks. And I thought it was interesting, so I thought I'd show you. Now, in the UK, on various drinks, it'll say um usually how much per 100 ml it won't say the exact amount because a can might change might you might have a big can or a small can um so this one says it on yeah 30 milligrams per 100 ml so times five uh three times five is it's, we're gonna carry the four and then minus the six 150 so this sugar-free monster energy drink has 150 milligrams in it so keep that in mind. This is how we're going to do it. We're not doing it per 100 mil. We're doing it like a, a can, basically. Um, and you can see the different versions. So Sprite, 7-Up, Lemonade, don't have it. Normal Coke has less caffeine in it than um, various other different similar products. So Coke Zero has more caffeine in it. Diet Coke has almost the same amount of caffeine as a Mountain Dew. And that blew my mind. Dr. Pepper has a lot of caffeine in it as well, which is very interesting. Um, and I would like to know, I don't think it's on here, but like diet, uh, diet Dr. Pepper. So um, diet, uh, Dr. Pepper Light is what we'd call it in Europe, uh, I guess. So Diet Coke, Coke, Coke Light, uh, a lot. And if we look at, you know, tea, black tea, again, this is just milligrams, so it's very hard. Like how, how much you have? You have a liter of black tea? That's going to be way more, isn't it? Um, so green tea, black tea, so normal tea, but without any milk, about the same as a Diet Coke, which is very interesting. I don't think people realize that. Uh, V8 plus energy, we don't have that in here. Coca-Cola energy, 99 milligrams. Again, don't see that very often. A lot of these are very American, so we don't see them very often. Uh, instant coffee, so just a normal coffee, 57 milligrams. So about the same as a Mountain Dew. Very interesting. Um, we've got all the different types of coffee. So McDonald's coffee, 109. Here we go, Monster Energy. It says 145 here. That was definitely 150. We worked it out. Um, Rockstar, again, has got quite a little bit more. Five-hour energy. I don't see, you don't see those in the UK. I don't know if they're banned because they've got too much in them. Um, lots of different stuff. Brewed coffee has more um, caffeine in it uh, than a normal instant coffee. So it's very interesting that a brewed coffee, you know, with the actual beans and that, um, has so much more coffee in it. Uh, has so much more coffee in it, has so much more caffeine in it. Uh, and then you've got these crazy ones, which are 300 milligrams per can. G Fuel, having 300 milligrams per can, would have to have, in the UK, would have to have double the amount. So, so a 500 mil can, again, I don't know what that is in ounces for the American viewers. We do it in litres. This country is a mess when it comes to like measuring stuff. We we do old school and we do new school and then we mix stuff and then we do other things. But that would have to be have 60 milligrams of caffeine per 100 mil in order to be, you know, the same amount of caffeine in this kind of can. Which these are being sold in the UK now. We're slowly getting G Fuel stuff over here. And um, that's mental. That's really crazy. That's a lot of caffeine. Uh, the... American, the US, whatever it 
institution or federation or initialism that they they have recommends 400 milligrams that's usually about you know i think the uk the nhs is very similar that's how much you should have daily as a maximum um so you should try and keep it under and that works out at you know if you're having instant coffee four coffees it's probably going to you're going to be all right unless you have fancy ones but four coffees that's quite a lot of coffee for me uh or about two energy drinks maybe two and a bit um again four cokes quite a lot uh, obviously that varies from person to person some people are sensitive to caffeine some people aren't and obviously children pregnant people all that kind of stuff i just thought this was interesting um you probably think this is awful awfully boring this is a conspiracy is it not that they replaced the sugar with caffeine in diet coke think about that one thank you very much for watching really appreciate everybody's support and i will see you again next time on conspiracy 101